Okay, looks like we've got a, a good group today, and uh, sorry we couldn't be in, here in person and um, invite you guys to check out our local uh, foliage, but um, such as it is, we're very excited to have you, and um, we want to welcome everyone to the 20th annual Brattleboro Literary Festival. I'm Robert Parks. I'm the board president of the festival. We're excited today to present two great authors who are incredibly adept at mixing culture and history in a, a wonderful nonfiction narrative uh, in both of their new books. Um, today we'll have Michael Gore in conversation with Louis Menand, and uh, we will be talking about Louis's new book, The Free World, Art and Thought in the Cold War. And as we do so, I'm sure a lot of Michael's book, The Saddest Words, William Faulkner's Civil War, will probably peek through, and we'll hear a little bit about that as well. Uh, you can submit questions to Michael and to Louis via the Q&A button on your screen. Um, if your question has already been submitted, give it a little up boost. Uh, click on somebody else's question. Give them the thumbs up icon to show that you really want that question answered. There will also be links in the chat to purchase uh, these guys' books at the end and also to donate to the festival. We're a band of uh, volunteers running this thing and we have a lot of great fun, but we do have uh, needs to fund it every year. And so your donations will be appreciated. A special thank you uh, to our sponsors. Um, let me introduce uh, Michael and Louie and then uh, let Michael uh, run with this, uh, with his uh, discussion of uh, Louis's new book. Michael Gore is the author of The Saddest World, William Faulkner's Civil War. His earlier books include Portrait of a Novel, Henry James and the Making of an American Masterpiece, a finalist for the Pulitzer in Biography. The Bells and Their Silence, Travels Through Germany, is another of his books. After Empire, Scott, Nepal, Rushdie, and finally, uh, his book, The English Novel in the, at Mid-Century. He has received a Guggenheim Fellowship, two fellowships at the National Endowment for the Humanities, including a pu Public Scholar Award and a National Book Critics Circle Award for his work as a reviewer. His essays and reviews have appeared in the New York Review of Books, the TLS, The Atlantic, the New York Times Book Review. In 2014, he was a judge for the National Book Award in Fiction. He is the Mary Augusta Jordan Professor, Professor of English Language and Literature at Smith College. And now let me introduce Louis, um, who is the Lee Simpkins Family Professor of Arts and Sciences and the Ann T. and Robert M. Bass Professor of English at Harvard. Um, since 2001, Louis Menand has been a staff writer at The New Yorker, where he began writing uh, in 1991 for The New Yorker. His books include The Metaphysical Club, which won the Pulitzer Prize in History, and the Francine, Francis Parkman Prize from the Society of American Historians. In 2016, he was awarded the National Humanities Medal by President Barack Obama. His new book, The Free World, Art and Thought in the Cold War, is a follow-up to his book, The Metaphysical Club. And today we will uh, be talking about the free world, art and thought in the Cold War. Congratulations, both of you, on your new books. And I'm really excited to, to hear um, your thoughts on, uh, uh, Michael, your thoughts on, on Louis's book. Take it away. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Well, it's, it's a huge book, Luke. It's, it's a huge book. There's everything in it from George Kennan to Black Mountain College Faye Dunaway. Um, as you say in, in your preface, it's like a novel with 100 characters. Obviously, one question that any reader is going to have is that of what went into it. How did you choose what to put in? How did you choose what to leave out? Um, that's not where I want to start, though. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. But you also talk in the, your introduction about the personal motivation for writing this book, trying to understand the world you grew up in, filling in the blanks of your childhood, as it were, of your own story, the half-heard background noise to childhood and adolescence. You also say that you wrote the book to help you understand the nature of the word that we heard so much in our Cold War childhoods. That is, and that we hear again a lot now, freedom. 
that word. It's a word used to ingest, to justify everything, invoked to justify everything. So let's start there. Uh, tell us a little bit about the young Luke Menon, um, and then about your shifting understanding of that word, of its use and its abuse. Yeah, um, that's a big place to start. Uh, let me just thank it's awful, but <laughs> <laughs> let me just thank the organizers of the festival for having me on to talk about the book, and uh, my friend Michael Gora for agreeing to to interview me or discuss the book with me. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I felt that in the case of this book, I needed to acknowledge a kind of personal interest in it because I'm writing about things that took place. Most of them took place when I was growing up. Um, so the book covers the period 1945, the end of the Second World War to 1965. And that's the year the United States intervened militarily in Vietnam. That's when we sent the Marines and we started <clears throat> bombing North Vietnam. So those are the bookends of the project. I was born in 1952. So I grew up during a lot of this stuff that I'm writing about was happening. Um, and my parents were intellectuals. Um, their main interest was in politics. They were certainly not avant-gardists. Um, their idea of High culture was reading Anthony Trollope, but they, they were very liberal um, politically, very anti-war people, um, kind of New Deal people. And so when I grew up, there was a lot of talk in the house about politics, and they were interested in what was going on culturally, even though that wasn't necessarily their taste. So pretty much all the people I write about in the book, from Hannah Arendt to, um, to Andy Warhol, people whose names I heard when I was growing up. Um, around the house or people my parents knew. Um, but of course, as Michael put it, it's, it was all background noise because, you know, I was, I was reading the Hardy Boys. I wasn't reading, you know, Norman Mailer. So um, in a way, this was an effort to, the book that I wrote was an effort to kind of, you know, learn about that part of my life that I wasn't really very aware of when I was growing up. Then, of course, as I got older and started teaching, I got interested again in that period and those writers. So most of my career, I've been interested in the people I write about in the book. And then I decided to put it all together into this, into this package. One of the things I realized as I was writing the book is what Michael mentioned, which is the prevalence of the term freedom. Everybody uses it to justify whatever it is that they're doing. It's just omnipresent. This doesn't just include liberal politicians. It includes segregationists like George Wallace, talked about freedom from federal interference. Um, Barry Goldwater talked about freedom, John F. Kennedy did. Um, but even artists like John Cage, the composer talked about freedom. So it just is, it's a, it's a, it's a current of the, through the period. That's partly because of course, freedom was the slogan of the United States and the liberal democracies in the Cold War. That's what we stood for. Um, so that's part of the reason I think it had currency, but it really floods the whole, field. So as I was writing about these figures talking about freedom to do whatever it is that they're doing, I realized that when I was a kid, if somebody had said to me, what's the most important thing in life, I would have said freedom. Um, and I think I, you know, I'm still a person who kind of believes that at some level. But uh, when I was writing the book, I realized where I got that from, I didn't make it up. It's that's how everybody was talking. So that became a theme of the book. It wasn't planned, quite planned that way, but that emerged as an important subject. And then of course, when you're a kid, you have a very clear idea of what freedom entails. I can eat as much ice cream as I want, or I can skip school or whatever. But when you get older, um, you see it's a very complicated concept. Um, you start reading sociology books and you go to graduate school and you read Foucault or whatever, and you start to see that this notion of freedom, which is very much implanted in us through our socialization, um, is a very problematic concept. So that interested me too. How did these figures cope with the problematic nature of the concept of freedom? Um, how did they? How did that transform the way they made art, or the way they made music, or the way they, you know, chose their political preferences? And then I think Michael is implying that um, the term freedom now has quite different meaning than the meaning that it had in the fifties and sixties. So on the whole, in that earlier period, freedom is associated with the left. I mentioned that a lot of right-wing people also 
you know, um, use that term. But we think of freedom as associated with things like the new left or the free speech movement or liberal politics generally, the war in court. Today, freedom is generally a slogan of the right. It's interesting that that's really changed a lot. And people on the right talk about the freedom not to get vaccinated or not to wear a mask or to carry a gun or whatever. Um, it's, it's generally a slogan of, of right-wing politics, not left-wing politics. Left-wing politics, now the slogan is equality, social justice, and so forth. And often freedom is regarded as a way for people to resist those kinds of reforms. So that was also interesting to look back on this earlier period from the period I was writing the book and see how much things have changed. You know, as you, you're talking, I was thinking of Isaiah Berlin with his notion of you know, the different concepts of freedom and basically the freedom to do something and the freedom from something. Yeah. And the freedom from government interference from Yeah, yeah. This is a this is a famous essay by Berlin's called Two Concepts of Liberty, which was Berlin was a British philosopher, it was published in 1958. And um as Michael says, he distinguishes um two kinds of freedom, what he calls negative freedom or freedom from. So that's just whatever I want to do, you can't tell me not to do it. I have freedom from coercion by others. And there's something that Berlin calls freedom for, which is the idea that freedom is a value in order to achieve some other end, in addition to freedom or besides freedom. What he clearly has in mind is equality. So those two freedoms, freedom from stands for sort of absolute liberty, freedom for stands for a kind of society in which freedoms are in the name of some other good like equality, are, is a kind of Cold War dichotomy because the United States and the liberal democracies stood for freedom from, at least propagandistically, and the Soviets uh, and their uh, allies and satellites stood for freedom for. Um, so that's an important uh, dynamic in the period is what we mean by freedom. So I would say to, to follow up on Michael's suggestion that contemporary left is a freedom for uh, ideology uh, and the contemporary right is a freedom from. Yeah, that, that, I, I think that makes sense, and I, I would agree with that. I, one of the things I notice is, is that the book the book starts with politics, um, and then it moves into culture, and it comes back with politics yeah. at the end. Another way to put that is is that you begin and end with George Kennan. Yeah. Uh, and so, so why why Kennan? Why why start there? Yeah. So of all the choices I had to make, that was most obvious because uh, George Kennan was the American diplomat who is responsible for what's called the policy of containment. So Kennan was uh, in the American embassy in Moscow in 1946, <clears throat> serving under Avril Harriman, who was the American ambassador to the Soviet Union. And he was asked by the State Department to explain Stalin's intentions. So as everyone knows, the Soviet Union was an ally of the US and the UK during the Second World War, uh, for the last three years of the Second World War. And in fact, we couldn't probably have defeated Nazi Germany without the Red Army. Um, so there was a kind of display of comedy between Churchill, Roosevelt, and Stalin, even though Churchill hated communism, um, but they felt they had to trust one another. When the war was over in 1945, um, it wasn't clear what kind of role the, so the Soviet Union would play in world affairs, whether it would be cooperative with the US and the UK and France and so on or not. And it became clear that Stalin was being difficult and uncooperative on a number of issues, like Berlin and so forth. Um, so anyway, Kennan was asked to write the State Department a memo explaining what Stalin's intentions were. And Kennan wrote a document that's called the Long Telegram, because it's 6,000 words or something, the longest telegram in State Department history, explaining the Soviet Union is going to be hostile to us because that's the nature of Russian politics. It's always been the nature of Russian politics. They fear the West. They fear outsiders. So he's not going to cooperate with us. Plus, he's a terrible dictator. So what we need to do is contain communism by keeping it in its box. That's what the doctrine of containment means. Um, and it will destroy itself of its own inefficiency. This is 1946. So that becomes, it kind of goes back to the United States. He gets a job in the State Department. He writes an article in Foreign Affairs saying the same thing. That becomes the, basically the policy of the United States um, that follows up through the Vietnam period. Then when Vietnam happens, it's a crisis for the policy of containment. Because did Kennan mean when he wrote that in 1946 that the United States had to intervene militarily 
in a situation like the situation in Southeast Asia, where a communist country was, was going to invade a non-communist country, North Vietnam and South Vietnam. So in 1966, the year after we send the Marines, Canada is called before the Senate Foreign Affairs Committee, and he's asked, is this what you meant by containment? And he can't answer the question because it's a very difficult question to answer. So what he meant was we would contain by non-military means. We would have counter pressures, economic, cultural, whatever, against Soviet efforts to expand. But he, he didn't have in mind that we would drop the bomb on communists, but that's what we were doing in North Vietnam. So it's not clear whether that was to follow the policy of containment or not. So I end the book with Vietnam as I start the book with Canada because that's the framework of that period of American history. After Vietnam, everything changes. It's a whole different story politically, culturally, intellectually. This, the world becomes a very different place. But in those 20 years between the end of the war and the beginning of the Vietnam period, uh, there is a kind of coherence to uh, cultural and political life. Well, you, 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 you said that Kennan thought we, one of the ways we should fight Stalin was, was culturally. So let, 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 let's switch over to that. And yeah. One of the things you say quite late in the book, um, and I want to put this out there and then we, then we can bracket and I want to go to something else is that you said, of course, the CIA would sponsor writers critical of US policy. Yeah. Um, and that, that's one of the ways in which, in which we show that we're different from them, quote, yeah. is, is, yeah. is that we sponsor our own critics, uh, which puts those critics into a possibly compromised yeah. position. Yeah. Uh, but but let, let's let's back up a little bit. Um, you said you didn't grow up in a household that was that interested and invested in the avant-garde, though I think reading Trollope is a pretty good thing to do. Um, but <laughs> um, there's an awful lot in your book about the avant-garde, though, yeah. uh, as represented by Black Mountain College, you know, Cage and Cunningham and yeah. Rochford and Jasper Johns and so on. Yeah. Um, there's a lot about about the uh, Warhol eventually, who's a kind of avant-garde, or Jackson sure. Pollock, or yeah. Eats. Um, yeah. uh, when I think about that period, though, what I what I think of is maybe this is just me is is not so much um, high culture or not so much the avant-garde as a kind of broad, robust middle brow culture. Uh -huh. um, you know, of um, I don't know. Network TV news, yeah. movies like North by Northwest, uh, Broadway musicals, and so on. So, so tell us about the maybe about the tension between those different kinds of culture, or about why there's so much about the avant-garde in here. You do have Elvis and the Beatles, yeah. and and late late in the novel, late late in the novel, in in, in the book, you've got um, the start of New Hollywood with with uh, right. with Bonnie and Clyde, but but. Why so much about the avant-garde? Yeah, I think because I think the it's a good question. I think the period is a period of enormous creativity in the arts. Um, it starts right after the war. There's a lot, probably lots of reasons why there was this explosion of creativity. Part, but part of it was just was this feeling that people had that there was a clean slate. You remember that the world had been through a depression that lasted almost ten years and then followed immediately by a a world war that lasted almost six years. Um, and I think a lot of people felt all over the world that this is an opportunity to start over again. That's, that's pretty rare in history that you have those moments. And so for people in the arts, they felt they could reinvent music, they could reinvent painting, they could reinvent poetry. Um, they, don't, they, they, they could start all over. And so it, that's why the avant-garde interests me because those are the questions that they ask. What's the nature of painting? Let's just say I put my canvas on the floor and I throw paint on it with a stick. Is that a painting? Why is that a painting? It is a painting, but why? Let's say that I create a piece for the piano in which the, the, the performer doesn't play a note and it lasts for four minutes and 33 seconds. Is that, a, is that music? Why is that music? Let's say I compose a poem which is built around the energy of my body and my voice rather than what the eye can see. Is, is that as good a poem as a poem by T.S. Eliot or John Donne? So those are questions that people were asking, and I think it led to all kinds of creative, uh, creative things going on. And in the popular culture, which is also obviously, there's lots of things going on there as well, 
The most interesting thing, I think, to me to try to figure out was the rise of rock and roll. And that also is creative. It's people doing something that hadn't really been done before, taking a certain kind of music that hadn't been performed by white performers like Elvis Presley and making a sound out of it. And that sound becomes very infectious and it starts to go around the world and ultimately produces the Beatles, which come back here and influence on American sound. Um, so I use that example. And I also use the example of, as you said, Hollywood movies, which have a similar story in which Hollywood movies influence, in this case, French cineasts and critics and directors in the 40s and 50s. And they start making movies that come here in the 60s and influence American directors. So I'm interested in those transnational currents as well. Yeah, there is a big what we would call now, was it even called at the time, middlebrow culture. I mean, include Broadway plays, certain kinds of movies, certain kinds of fiction. Um, intellectuals on the whole were quite contemptuous of that culture. Uh, I think that there was a strong feeling, Dwight MacDonald is the a symbol of this kind of criticism, that um, they regarded it as kind of uh, meretricious because it was an effort to kind of make money out of making people feel better about themselves by producing uplifting plays and movies and so forth. So the fact that there was contempt for this among intellectuals is interesting culturally to me, kind of more interesting than the shows themselves. So that's what I tended to write about. <clears throat> One thing I noted too, is that there, there's a lot more about the visual arts than yeah. there is about literature. Yeah. Um, very little about the novel. And I'm wondering, say, yeah. you know, the, I mean, the novel in the 50s is sort of dead. Um, it's the kind of when people are asking about that question, but when, yeah. when you know, Bellow's doing something different, but it's not new in the same way that you're talking about. Intention, I guess, comes later. Yeah, yeah. Susan Sontag used to complain in the early 60s when she started <clears throat> writing her criticism that, the, that the fiction has just not gotten avant-garde in the United States. Right. It was in France, as you know, you know, the new novel. Um, I mean, there was a lot going on elsewhere, but the US it somehow never kind of got took off until after the 60s with writers like Pinch and Bartholomew and so forth. So the postmodern novel doesn't really emerge until after the period that I'm writing about. So consequently, did not get a lot of airtime in my book. I felt that too, oddly, because we're both trained as English professors and you would think that we think literature yeah. would be an important part of the story, but I think poetry is. I think the novel is less so. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and the problem with the, the, the new novel is that nobody even nobody wants to read it very much. Nobody wants to read it. Even uh, yeah, even yeah. Susan Sontag finally realized yeah, that. Yeah, was, yeah. No, I mean she she very much realized it. But yeah. but but you you talk about the the circulation of things from one culture to another. I mean that that you you said at one point that the history of the movie industry up until I don't know maybe the '60s is a kind of rivalry between France and the U.S. Yeah, uh, and then the U.S. wins. Um, and, <laughs> and but but one of the things I noticed is is that it's basically the story you're telling is basically a story of New York and Paris. Yeah. Um, there's a little bit about London and Britain in there. Yeah. Um, there's not other American cities don't really play much of a role. Even when you talk about the movie industry, it's focused on New York critics. That's true. Um, yeah. No Chicago. But also no Berlin, no Tokyo. So explain those those the, the the axis of your story between between New York and Paris, basically, and not not other places. Yeah, it does turn out that way. Um, so I should say just to sort of clarify this whole why did I live put this and take and leave that out is that I didn't really when I started writing it have a plan for the book. I didn't I mean I knew where I wanted to end. I, I knew I knew I had to get from you know, the first canon to the second canon um, from World War II to Vietnam. Um, and I knew there were certain things I obviously had to write about like existentialism, but I didn't really anticipate, I didn't really plan ahead of time too much until I got about a halfway through. And then I could sort of see where I needed to go to get to 65. But before that, I kind of let the material dictate what I should write about. I just picked the things that seemed obviously important that had to be that had to be written about. Um, and that, you know, I didn't, I didn't have a sort of principle of selection, in other words, except to sort of follow the material where, wherever it led. The, the thing I really regret not doing, and that was just a question of time and space, because the book is very long as it is, was Tokyo, because, which you mentioned, because Japanese avant-garde art is really important 
it predates a lot of American avant-garde art in those 50s. Um, and then there was a lot of interchange between Japanese and American artists. I mean, famous examples, Yoko Ono, but there's a lot of people like that who come from Japan to New York, they get involved with the art scene, go back to Japan, come back again. And there are a lot of Americans like John Cage who went to Japan a lot. Uh, and then of course the whole story of the rebuilding of Japan is an incredible story as well. So that was a big part of the story, obviously had a place in the way I was telling the story that I couldn't, couldn't put in. In terms of New York and Paris, yeah, it's a cliche uh, that dates really from 1941 that the capital of the art world moves from Paris to New York. And I tried to avoid cliches in my thinking about the period, but you can't avoid it. I mean, it, I was astonished by how many French people turn out to be really important in the story from Jean-Paul Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir to Claude Lévi-Strauss to Derrida uh, to Jean-Luc Godard. Um, they're just really important pieces of the, of the cultural story of this period. When I realized how important they were, I also realized at that point, this is pretty early on when I'm writing about Faulkner and Sartre, um, I realized that a lot of the story also is just transnational, that it's about cultural exchange. There's a tendency for American historians, or let's just say for Americans to be very US centric. So we tend to think the story, for example, of the civil rights movement is a very US story having to do with the civil war and Jim Crow and you know the Brown versus Board of Education. So we tell it in kind of as a US narrative, but from the point of view of the rest of the world, the American civil rights movement was part of the movement of decolonization, which is a global movement after 1945. They saw this same thing happening around the world that was happening here. Um, so I tried to tell the, I told the civil rights story that way too, because I tried to tell these stories from a global perspective as much as I could and as much as I was competent to do. But I wanted to bring out that this culture is not just American culture. This culture is the culture of the free world, of all these places exchanging people and ideas um, through this period. Well, when, when you said transmission and exchange, what one of the things that that that, that requires or involves people meeting each other. People yeah. meeting each other and ricocheting off each other and yeah. and, and so on in lots of ways. Um, uh, you describe a lot of personal meetings, a lot of personal connections and links. You know, Lionel Trilling and Allen Ginsberg, yeah. uh, Clement Greenberg and Jackson Pollock, the, the constellation of people at Black Mountain, um, other meetings between people. Um, how do those things work in a narrative? I mean, they, they make for a stronger narrative, it gives you people to move around, not just ideas. Yeah. Is that easier to animate? Yeah, I mean, it suits me as a writer, so that's one thing, but, yeah. well, more, but more historiographically, which is your question, um, I try to avoid a tendency that cultural historians have to generalize about a whole period, you know, characterize the 50s or characterize the 60s. I just think that's something you want to avoid because you're, it's just reductive. Mm -hmm. You're trying, it, you know, it's procrustean. You're trying to cram everybody into a general a thesis. So I don't have it, apart from the sort of ubiquity of the word freedom, I don't have a thesis per se. I have a, something I'm trying to show you, but I'm not trying to show you at 50,000 feet. I'm trying to show you at street level, I'm trying to show you the way things look to people when they're trying to figure out how to make a painting or how to write a book, um, you know, at that moment and who they run into and what happens to them that has an effect on the decisions that they make artistically and intellectually. That's what interests me. I want, but I want, the reason the book is so long partly is because I want the reader by traveling at street level to see the big picture when they get towards the end of the book. And now you can see there's an arc here. There's a story that's being told has to do with America moving from the periphery to the center of world culture. That's the story that's being told. But I'm not trying to fit everything into that thesis. I'm trying to show things that happen when they happen. So it's always fascinating. I mean, we talk about, I talked about the drip paintings. You know, the story is that Pollock and Lee Krasner, who's also an important painter, also close to Clement Greenberg, the art critic, um, uh, bought a house in the Hamptons in Springs, back when it was cheap to live in the Hamptons, because they didn't have any money. And Pollock was painting, at that point was painting sort of mural sized canvases. And he wanted to stretch a canvas and the walls of the house they had bought were too small to fit one. So he put the canvas on the floor and he started throwing paint on it. And he had a can of paint, he had usually a stick, he put the stick in the can and then fling it 
on a canvas. Sometimes he used a brush, other things, but that's basically how he made those paintings and he liked it. And then when they converted the, a barn on the property into a studio, he continued to put the canvas on the floor and throw paint on it. And so for three and a half years, 1947 or 1950, he created this incredible body of work. I mean, I think the most beautiful paintings in the 20th century um, by this completely serendipitous method. He, he didn't think, oh, here's the way for painting to go, throw paint on the canvas. He just thought, I want to make a painting. I don't have a wallet to pick it up. What am I going to do? But it worked because it solved all kinds of problems, art world problems. And also he was incredibly good at it, but he didn't know that. That was Presley too. I had no intention of singing rock and roll. He wanted to be a ballad singer. By accident, he starts singing a, rock, a rhythm and blues song in this studio in Memphis, 1954. And the guy producer says, wait a second, that sounds really good. Let's record that. And it becomes rock and roll. So all kinds of things happen that look inevitable from 50,000 feet that on the ground could have come out completely differently. Or a big influence in this period, obviously, is German uh, and you know, European immigration from people who were fleeing from the Nazis, um, first from Germany uh, in the 30s, and then, of course, from through France in 1940 and 1941. They had a big influence on American culture. Joseph Albers was the big teacher at Black Mountain College, which is where Robert Rauschenberg went to school, a big influence on Rauschenberg. Harold, uh, Arnold Schoenberg was a big influence on John Cage. He moved to Los Angeles in the 30s. So that's also something that's serendipitous in the sense these people would never have come to the United States without the pressure of Nazism that they needed to flee from. So I'm very interested in the way that things happen on the ground, which are very unpredictable, and that produce results that then become iconic. That's fascinating to me. I'll, I'll, go, I'll go to a cliche of my own, which is what, what you're saying is you have to see the trees before you can see the forest. Yeah, yeah, you do. Yeah, you're really close. And to then you hope you can see the forest. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and then you hope you can see the Another thing that, that occurred is, as, as you were talking is that you know, the French go to New York, the French refugee, and the, the Germans go to Los Angeles. Yeah. Um, they, they get there a little early and we know the Germans like sun, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny that the French didn't want to go to America at all. No. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so they got, they, most of those that went back right away, but the Germans tended to stay, especially the musicians, because they were here for much longer. Right, right. So you said that you, you, you thought that the Pollock paintings are the most beautiful paintings of the 20th century. And um, I'm not, I, I don't want to talk about Pollock so much, but, but one of the things that, that strikes me about that statement is it's, it's not a statement you make in the book. Yeah. Um, that I, I think of you when I read you as having a kind of very cool style, um, almost yeah. butter wouldn't melt. <laughs> questions, give answers. Sometimes you show why the obvious answer is deceptive or naive or illusional. But your yeah. sentences don't often get ruffled by emotion. You don't tell us which of these works you especially like or admire or that move you or trouble you. You, you sort of say why they're important. Um, I think I, I got about page 500 before there was an openly expressed judgment. What was that? Um, I'll read it to you. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Deconstruction is a via negativa. Oh. It's good for getting down to what Demand called the mechanical level of language, but it can't bring anything substantive back. Yeah. Um, you know, but so, so, <laughs> you know, you go fact, 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 and maybe judgments in short sentences, and maybe judgments sort of creep in between the sentences in yeah. a kind of paratactic way. But the implications of those facts often go unsaid. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll put it crudely. Uh, yeah. Go back to the Pollock. Yeah, you you really like those paintings. Yeah, they're um, good paintings. What else do you really like? Or like is that all, not a relevant I, question? I like all this stuff. I like everything I wrote about. Okay. I like all these people. Yeah, okay. I, I'm fascinated by them. I think they're incredible, incredible people as artists and as thinkers. No, I mean, if there's a few cases where I'm less enthusiastic, but on the whole, no, the people I wrote about are are amazing people. But that's not my job as a writer is not to try to persuade readers that these are amazing people. That, that I should not have to do that. I want, look, one thing I hate when I'm a reader is to be told what to think. Yeah. I want to be told what, what was going on, what happened, I looked the way it was. Mm -hmm. and I think that's my job as a writer is to tell like it is. And then you can make up your own mind whether you think a silent piece for piano is bogus or art. 
you know, I'm not going to tell you. Why should I tell you? So yeah, I you know, cold is a, is a fair word for it. Um, but it's not because I don't care. It's just because of my I'm just a normal person. My preferences aren't any more interesting than yours or anybody else's. Um, I'm trying to introduce you to things you didn't know or things you thought you knew, but you didn't really know. You thought you understood Pollock or you thought you understood Warhol. We thought you understood James Baldwin or Susan Sontag, but this is what they were really like. This is how they really did what they did. And then you can make, draw your own conclusions about it. So yeah, it's the same reason I don't have a thesis I'm hitting you over the head with in every chapter. I want you to just, I want you to make up your own mind as a reader. Okay, so it's almost a, what is it, the dragnet line, just the facts me. Pretty much. Yeah. yeah. Tell it like it is. That's what Howard yeah. Cosell used to say. Yeah. <laughs> Howard Cosell. Another Cold War figure. Yeah. Um, Important yeah. to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so I want to, I've got a couple more questions and then, and then we'll move to, to, to a QA. Um, okay. As, as I go back to the CIA, as the CIA sponsored writers critical of US policy. Yeah. Um, as nearly as I can tell, there's no reference in here to what Eisenhower called the military-industrial complex. It's in um, there. It's in there. Okay. I quote him. Yeah. Or to the cultural role of industry as such, you know, the aerospace, the nascent computer industry. There's a little bit about Detroit. Um, right. <laughs> one of the things, one of the things that that I notice is we get towards the end of the book. Um, uh, you talk about the 60s student movement. And I think one of the things you suggest is that the failures of that movement are contained in the initial conception of that movement. Uh, and correct me if I'm misreading you, that is in their hostility or lack of interest in programs as such, uh, but instead emphasizing authenticity, sort of right yeah. feeling. Uh, yeah. a kind of you know, free speech, but not free speech for anything in particular. Yeah. Um, uh, can we extend that into later periods? So that what? Sorry. Can we extend that into later periods as as we think about the, you know, the the '60s student movement was you know by you know well, let's call it a liberal movement. Yeah. Um, can we extend that that failure if there was a failure? into later periods. I mean, the, the emphasis on authenticity, on feeling right, on yeah. thinking right, as opposed to doing things. Yeah. Um, I have a lot of sympathy with the early new left, um, but I think it was very influenced by existentialism because that's what Hayden was into, both Haydens, Casey and Tom Hayden. Um, and he was really the... <clears throat> person who drafted the Port Huron, Port Huron Statement in 62, which launched sort of SDS as this national organization. Um, and I point out how difficult the ideals of the Port Huron Statement and the new left were to live up to. And I can maybe put it simply by saying that if you treat freedom as an absolute, you're never gonna get there. Mm -hmm you're constantly going to be on the barricades because it just, it just isn't, it's impossible to treat for even free speech, for example, as an absolute, there's all kinds of ways in which we constrain speech. We, you know, there's millions of laws against all kinds of speech that, that you could be criminalized that are criminalized. Um, we, we don't like to acknowledge that, but it's true. So if you make that into an absolute, you're just fighting, you're fighting endlessly. You never can reach the end of the, you, you can only approach that asymptotically. Same thing with authenticity. What does that even mean authenticity really? But if you really tried to live that way every minute, you, know, you, you, would, you would be fighting your whole life. So in, in, in the, it's fine if you wanna live that way. I mean, you know, I probably tried to live that way, but if you, have a, if you have a political program, you're not gonna achieve a lot by absolutizing everything. And I think that's sort of what happened. You just, they, Hayden wanted to be just out there over the void all the time. And you, you could get people there for a while about certain things that are very inflammatory, like Vietnam, but they're not going to stay there. So it's, it's a criticism just to say, you know, there's a limitation on political movements of that kind. And that, I think that did, that movement did suffer from that. I mean, it was an impossible moment, Vietnam too, for everybody, but particularly on the left. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
the, the last question is, is you talk about, and I guess this, this will go back to the CIA funding its own critics. Yeah. <laughs> um, you talk at a certain moment about uh, culture as a kind of Mobius strip. Yeah. Uh, you know, with, with Trilling and his, um, his rebellious student, Allen Ginsberg, as both being on the same strip. Uh, yeah. They're on different twists of it, but culture's a Mobius strip so that even the op an oppositional culture gets its meaning from what it's opposing. Yeah. Even the avant-garde takes its meaning from a kind of mainstream that it's repudiating. Right. Um, so you said the adversarial is built into the system. Yeah. Uh, it can't exist without the system. And that makes different positions at times seem to dissolve into each other. Yeah. Um, is there is any any way to get outside that? No. Any possibility of real change? No. <laughs> okay. No. I mean, you, a culture gets the adversarial culture that it wants. And in the 50s, that was the beats. They were perfect. They were exactly what people like, mainstream people like, let's say, Lyle Trilling, for example, needed to bounce off of, and vice versa. They, they were codependent. I mean, that's, but that's, I just think historically, that's how, how it works. No, you can't, you can't, you can't get out. <laughs> I didn't think so. Uh, um, but, but one of the things that suggests is that, is that the adversarial, adversarial culture is never really a threat. Well, it affects its dialectical, you know, it affects the mainstream culture. Mainstream culture picks up values that it can appropriate that are not threatening and so forth. That happened with rock and roll, you know, obviously, but it happens with a lot of conquest of cool, as Thomas Frank called it. It happens a lot because that's what the mainstream culture wants. It wants to feed off the adversarial, um, but make it into uh, an anodyne product. And it, capitalism is very, very good at that. <clears throat> to absorb absorb the nudge and then yeah 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 that's yes. why john lennon's songs advertise cars or whatever i mean it's just it's easy to do that by a certain mechanism and you know that's what anyway, that's what a lot of the critique of capitalism is about but the critique gets co-opted too okay. okay we're going to turn to questions and uh i didn't ask you about english departments as oh no an that's email true. um but yeah. uh uh, we'll we'll leave that for another time. But but Bob has some questions in the chat for us in the Q and A. Okay, great. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, thank you so much, Michael. Um, that was a really thoughtful uh, discussion uh, of uh, of Louis's book, and we've got some thoughtful questions in the Q and A. So I wanted to make sure we got to them. Um, one is about. Um, at, asking Professor Manand if he would talk a little bit about black literature and criticism of the time. Richard Wright, uh, Ralph Ellison, James Baldwin, um, Fanon or CLR James, um, you know, even what about the, the blues? Um, somebody's wondering, uh, Ross is wondering if we could uh, discuss that uh, topic a little bit. Yeah, uh, I do cover a lot of that in the book. Um, and uh, I focus partly uh, on James Baldwin because uh, he is an interesting figure beyond his own ex exceptional uh, talents as a writer and as a, also as a public speaker, because he's kind of unpredictable. I find him a very complicated person. And uh, so I wanted to spend some time with him. Um, he's important also because he lived in France for nine years. So he moved to Paris in 1948 from he was living in the village in New York, and he was suffering from racial discrimination, probably homophobia as well. And he decided to move to Paris, where a lot of Americans went after the war. It was very cheap to live in Paris. So a lot of Americans there, and he flew over. And one of the Americans who was living there was Richard Wright, the novelist, uh, whom he'd met in New York um, before Wright went to Paris. And Wright spent the rest of his life in Paris. He exiled himself, basically. So. What's, there's a complicated story I'm not going to try to get into great details about Wright's rivalry with that Baldwin and vice versa. But what's interesting to me was that this period that Baldwin is in Paris from 1948 to 1957 is a period when decolonization is a big subject in France, particularly in intellectual life, partly because of figures like Franz Fanon and Aimé Césaire, uh, who are uh, anti-colonial former French subjects from Martinique, 
um, partly because there's a Congress of Negro writers and artists, as it's called in Paris, 1956, that Baldwin goes to and writes an article about, and partly because uh, France is engaged in two post-colonial wars, one in China and then one in Algeria. So it's a big topic. And so Baldwin is able to see the American civil rights movement in the context of global decolonization. So that's important. When he comes back, 57, he meets King, he admires King greatly, and he becomes kind of a spokesperson for the civil rights movement. So I talk a lot about that. And then I also talk about uh, an article written by a white critic, Irving Howe, in Descent, which was his magazine, uh, in which he attacked uh, Baldwin uh, and Ralph Allison and defended Richard Wright. Richard Wright had published Native Son in 1940, it was a big bestseller. Um, and Baldwin ignored this attack by Irving Howe, but Ralph Allison responded to it. Uh, because Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man in 1952, you know, was also a successful book. So I talk about that argument that Howe and Ellison have about Black writing, um, how basically feeling Black Americans could only write protest literature, because that's their subject position. Ellison saying I can write any kind of literature that I want. Um, and I talk a little bit about uh, Invisible Man there. So yeah, I talk about that. In the case of the blues, um, you know, the, the part where it fits into my story is rhythm and blues, uh, which was a music, of course, performed by black artists for mainly black audiences in the 1940s and 50s. And then it gets picked up by white performers like Elvis, Pat Boone, uh, and so on, and becomes kind of a universal teenage music. Pat Boone. Right. I, I have to say, the, what you did with Anon and Cesare was, I thought, really illuminating. Thank you. Um, in the book, the way, the way bringing that particular French anti-colonial movement, which is very different from British anti-colonial movements, yeah. uh, into, into a kind of conversation with American civil rights. Uh, in a way, say that, 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 that the, the, the British material um, didn't really come into, into yeah. that kind of conversation, I think, historically. Um, That's right. That, yeah. that, was, that was a very shrewd move. Thank you. This is a fascinating and meaty discussion. We've got Wayne, um, who wants um, Louis to speak briefly about uh, the impact of the Kennedys. Um, Wayne was born in uh, 1951, and the central event for him was the assassination, um, and ele well, the election, and then the assassination. And uh, to him, he had a sense uh, that the country switched from vibrant colors to gray. Um, and I uh, wonder if that's reflected in the, the art of the time. Yeah, thank you. Um, that's a good observation. I don't really talk about the assassination. I do talk about JFK a little bit uh, because in the context of the word freedom, because he too used it continually, famously in the inaugural address, 1961. And then he gives a speech in Berlin in 1963, um, where each B9 Berliner speech where he says, as a free man, I'm proud to say that I am a Berliner. Um, and that's also, it uses the rhetoric of freedom a lot. So that's, I talk about him in that context a little bit. Um, but to, the, to, your, to your observation that the world changed in 63, yeah, of course, I remember that day quite well as well. Um, I think it didn't change overnight because if you'll remember that Johnson was incredibly popular in when he replaced Kennedy as president and he was reelected, he was elected himself to the office in 64 by what at the time was the largest popular vote margin in history. I think he got 62% of the popular vote against Barry Goldwater. And then his initial efforts on in legislation and the war on poverty and, and particularly voting rights and civil rights were regarded as great achievements by liberal Democrats like my parents. Um, it wasn't really until Vietnam that I think the gray skies descended. I've been trying for a long time to figure out, I felt I should write about it, but I'm not gonna fucking bear to do it. Why it was that the reaction against sending the troops to Vietnam was so violent so quickly. The protests against the war started up within weeks of the decision to send the Marines. And they of course escalated all the way up until 1970. Um, why was the country ready for that? Because there was no such thing happened in Korea. That was an unpopular war. More Americans died per day in Korea than in Vietnam. People didn't like it, but they didn't, they didn't blow up the country, but Vietnam sort of did. So I think that's the moment that the story really changes. 
Um, Fred, Fred wants to express um, his excitement that um, in your comments about the 60s, and he was, uh, Fred was a student then, and he was wondering if you could reflect on your um, points about the dangers of absolutizing, um, as in Hayden. Um, what, how is the, what's the rele relevance of these absolutes that started um, in this time uh, for today's social movements and today's politics and how what might be similar or might, what might be different? Yeah, it's just, I think I, I just gonna make some reflections personally that you know take, you can take forth their words, but um, you know, I think personally, we all have strong values that are effectively absolute as we try to live by them. I would say authenticity, for example, is one, even though I don't even know what that term means and I don't really believe in it, but I think it's important um, to me. And freedom is too, even though, again, I think, I'm not sure I know what, exactly what it means, but I know what it feels like. And I know same thing about authenticity, I know what it feels like. That's important. But I think when you go into the public sector and the public realm and you want, and you want to engage in politics, as to say, you want to change the way public life is conducted in that sphere, um, you, you can't carry those values with you in an absolute way. Um, I th and I think, so when I say I sympathize with the new left, which I do, the Port Huron statement, I mean, I, I buy all of that stuff. It's just that it doesn't really translate into actual politics of reform. Then you have to be able to get down and compromise. I mean, we're seeing that right now, you know, in, um, in Washington. Um, you come in with a lot of great ideas, but the end of the day to make anything happen, you have to give something up. Um, so that just, I just think that's kind of, I don't think it's something you figure out when you get older. I just think it's something when you're younger, you think save that for, I don't wanna deal with that question right now. I wanna live up to the, to the things that are important to me. And that's what happened. Michael, did you have thoughts? Uh, well, one, one is, I mean, what Luke just said brings me to one, one final thought of mine, which is, is to what degree uh, or in what way is the free world a book about today? I mean, most, most works of history are, are books as much about their, the time of their writing as they are about the period they subject, uh, or the, the period that, that they ostensibly study. So yeah, to what degree is, it, is this book about now? Yeah, well, I started writing a long time ago. So uh, and the, world has, the, world has changed, yeah, the world has changed quite a bit, but yeah, so, when I started writing it, I felt this period is sufficiently dead to be written about in the cold style that you've identified as my mode of writing. Because I felt, I felt that it, it, people had less at stake in this period than they, than they had before. When I, you can't write about the 60s and the 70s. I mean, you're just too tied up in it, but you can write about it in the 2000s. So I felt I could write about these these things from a distance that would enable me to be, I treat them as an historian treats them, you know, something in the past um, without feeling I had to get tied up in judgments and so forth, which you're right, I don't do that, but I don't do that because I don't think I need to do that. But as I finish the book, to answer your question, um, American life changed quite a bit after 2016. And I did start to see the relevance of a lot of things I was writing about to the way America was going after the election in 2016. And then when I finished the book, um, I was preparing it for press is when Biden was elected. And then I did feel a little bit that this was like 1945, that we had a chance to turn the page as a society and to sort of start over and rethink, for, among other things, the role of government in American life, um, what government should be doing for people. Um, you know, now I'm less optimistic than I was last fall, but it did make me feel like the book is relevant because it's good to look back at an earlier period when people had that feeling after 45 and thought we, we can do things in a different way. We can start over. We can forget about the past. Um, so I'm still hopeful that, that the future will look different. But when I finished the book, I thought this is a good time to go back and revisit that period. Yeah. That, that moment when we thought we could do anything. Yeah, right. Exactly. You know, we could reinvent government. We can reinvent art. Yeah. Those are exciting. Those are just exciting moments to think about. That, that's why I'm drawn to the avant-garde, as I said earlier, because I think that those questions, or even the case of the Hollywood movies, they were thinking, what is cinema? 
what makes a good movie? What is a, what's the essence of movies? People are asking those questions and that, that, that produces interesting creative results. Well, we have a, um, a few more minutes. If anybody has another uh, Q&A they want to um, plug in or, or uh, um, express your appreciation for this amazing uh, chat, um, we've been talking about The Free World, Art and Thought in the Cold War by Louis Menand. And um, Michael Gora has been uh, keeping this discussion really interesting. His new book is The Saddest, Worlds, uh, the Saddest Words, uh, William Faulkner's Civil War. Um, let me ask my own question, um, Louis. Sure. Um, so uh, I, I'm, I'm visualizing this this Cambrian explosion of creative thought uh, in this in this period. And uh, again, I just want to make a, par a parallel to what's happening today. Um, is is culture um, really fractured? Um, is that something that started then? I you know this. People say there's no pop music anymore. There's uh, nobody's listening to the same thing, uh, and um, are these all these micro channels and micro interests something that is a legacy of that uh, that started in that time? Yeah. So yeah. So that's a good question. And looking so looking back from today to this earlier period, um, you see gradually the increasing uh, audience for culture. Um, you see growth in book publishing, in the music industry, in the art world, the museum world, in universities, uh, films. Uh, there's just a lot more people getting access to more products. Today, that's kind of reached this incredible point where their cultural horizon is limitless. There's just so much product out there. There's so much music. There's so many streaming things you can stream. There's so much, uh, you know, literary fiction. There's uh, so much. Um, uh, art that, and it's all global. It all circulates around the world very quickly. So on, nobody's listening to the same thing, but everybody's listening to something. Um, so it's it's just enormous amount of access and availability of enormous variety of cultural products. It's an incredible moment historically for that. Uh, it's very cheap to get into the game. You could put your music video on Spotify and you get a million people watching it or YouTube. Uh, it's very cheap to access it. You just need access to Wi-Fi somewhere. That's that's incredible compared to earlier periods where you had to go to a bookstore or go to a movie theater or you can just sit in your living room or your dorm room or whatever. So what's different though is it's the landscape is very flat. There's not like a bunch of monuments out there that everybody knows about and everybody wants to talk about and argue about. Um, that's what's different about it. And in this earlier period, there are these monuments. There's the Pollock and the Warhol and the Baldwin and the whatever, these main figures, Hannah Arendt, who everybody needs to focus on and talk about. That, do that doesn't really true anymore. So we, in a way, we gave up that world, which was somewhat more hierarchical, for a world in which everything <laughs> seems to be possible, but uh, has a lot of, but it seems to be much more flat. So I think that's an interesting thing too. I'm mean, it's interesting to try to figure out how that happened um, and what the future is going to look like. Great. Um, well, thank you so much. Would uh, I would ask that our um, people in the audience uh, make a donation to the Brattleboro Literary Festival and buy these books uh, from Michael Gora and Louis Manon. And um, I don't think we have time to get to the last q a but somebody uh elizabeth just appreciate uh expresses her appreciation for the metaphysical club and how much she loved that book and um yeah. she uh she's curious about connections between that and this one but yeah. um thank you that's the book god wanted me to write the metaphysical club <laughs> yeah i'm glad you liked it um michael any closing um comments you know i just wanted to want to thank thank luke for uh a book that made me think on every page. Um, Thank you. Turning those pages and uh, and made me made me want to know what's happening next. Um, I, I will say you said that you know we put something out in Spotify and get a million people to watch it. If only we could do that with books. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I make I'll make a music video out of it. <laughs> Dancing free world. Yeah, rock in the free world. Yeah. Well, we can't wait to have you guys up uh, in person at the Brattleboro Literary Festival at some year in the future. And um, and thanks again. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, Luke.